This instructional video was produced in 1982 by Roger Kelly in the Department of Veterinary Pathology and Public Health, the University of Queensland, using the support of the Department of Audiovisual Services. It was designed to help third-year veterinary undergraduates in the practical component of their pathology course, during which they were required to dissect birds immediately after having humanely killed them. For this reason, a segment of the original video demonstrated the technique of euthanasia by cervical dislocation, which was the most common method of euthanasia used in the poultry industry at that time. Animal welfare considerations and student sensitivities have changed considerably since this video was made, so the euthanasia segment has been truncated and modified accordingly. The program demonstrates a sequence of dissection of the domestic fowl. It allows observation of all body systems and also demonstrates suitable methods for collection of specimens for laboratory examination. This dissection sequence is suitable for routine examination and should be used in your practical classes. The ability to recognise abnormalities in tissues, which is essentially what diagnostic pathology is all about, is greatly enhanced by the use of a consistent routine of dissection as, with experience, abnormalities become much more obvious when one is used to seeing the normal displayed in a familiar way. When selecting birds for autopsy from large units containing many individuals, it is better to take some live birds that are typical of the problem rather than to take those that are in extremis or are dead in which the primary disease may be obscured by secondary diseases or by post-mortem decomposition. The most humane, rapid method of euthanasia for necropsy is the injection of about 150 milligram of sodium pentobarbitone into a wing vein. Alternative methods, such as rapid intravenous injection of 7 to 8 mil of air, or cervical dislocation are probably still used when access to the narcotic is restricted or when skilled personnel are unavailable. But the use of barbiturate should be standard practice in professional diagnostic facilities. The wing with the left index finger. This approach can of course be used to collect blood samples from birds which are not to be killed. The exterior of the carcass is examined systematically. Firstly, the vent is examined for discharges. The skin is examined by reflecting the feathers, which may hide skin lesions or external parasites. The orifices of the head are examined for discharges and the colour of the mucous membranes is noted. The carcass is then positioned on its back with its legs towards you. A sharp knife is pushed through the fold produced by lifting the skin over the posterior part of the sternum. The knife is drawn back through this fold, producing a V-shaped incision. This incision is enlarged until the flap of skin that has been freed can be grasped firmly and drawn forward with the left hand while holding the legs with the right hand.
The knife is used again to continue the skin incision along the neck to the head. The skin is reflected from the upper part of the legs and the hip joints are dislocated. The carcass can now lie flat. The general colour and condition of the musculature is noted at this point. The carcass is rotated so that the head lies towards you. The skin is reflected from the structures of the neck. The mouth is opened and the left temporomandibular joint is cut through with shears. Scissors are then used to cut open the mouth, continuing the incision through the wall of the pharynx and esophagus as far as the crop. These structures are then opened out and examined for changes. The nasal cavities and infraorbital sinuses are next opened, firstly by cutting horizontally with shears through the beak just above the nostrils. These cavities are then opened and examined. The small cartilaginous nasal turbinates can now be winkled out using small scissors or a scalpel blade. These structures are part of the first line of defence of the respiratory system and may be fixed for subsequent histological examination as they may show changes which are specific for some of the respiratory diseases to which intensively housed poultry are prone. The larynx is next entered with small or sharp pointed scissors and the trachea is opened. Take care not to damage the mucosa more than necessary. In other words, use only the tips of the scissors. The trachea is now carefully spread and the mucosa examined for exudate and inflammation. Again, histological examination of the trachea can be very helpful in differentiating between the various respiratory diseases. The carcass is then rotated back to its original position with the tail towards you. The abdomen is opened with scissors starting just above the pubis. In this bird the abdomen was opened prematurely during skinning. 
The abdominal incision is carried forward through the costochondral junctions of the last few ribs on the left hand side of the bird. Then the scissors are used to cut the pectoral muscles on the left side of the thorax. The shears are used to cut the rest of the ribs the heavy coracoid bone and the clavicle on the left side only. Remaining ligaments and muscles are cut. The sternum is then firmly reflected to your left side until the coracoid bone on the other side breaks and that allows the contents of the thorax and abdomen to be displayed. The omentum is next cut and reflected. It is loaded with fat in this bird. The first structures to be displayed are the abdominal air sacs. These are easily destroyed and should be noted at this early stage of the abdominal dissection. Their walls should be very thin and transparent, as in this bird. A pale mucoid thickened appearance suggests chronic respiratory disease. The gizzard is drawn out to your left. The small intestine is picked up by its mesentery, thus avoiding pressure artifact in the bowel itself. And the intestine is drawn out to the left, freeing mesenteric attachments and air sacs. This manoeuvre exposes most of the abdominal viscera and organs, and the dissection has now reached what can be called the display stage. This is a most important stage of dissection in any species because most structures can for the last time be viewed in relationship with one another before being individually removed and dissected. This is the time for recording the general state of nutrition, presence or absence of anemia, exudates in serous cavities, hemorrhages, malposition of viscera, etc. At this stage, it is a good idea to stop and think about the overall pathology of the bird in relation to its history and clinical signs. For those whose avian anatomy is a little rusty, the following organs are demonstrated. Liver, spleen, ovary, in this case inactive in a non-laying bird, and left kidney high in the roof of the abdomen. The left lung. The intestine is freed posteriorly by cutting the colon just before it enters the cloaca. Then the colonic, cecal and small intestinal mesenteries are cut close to the gut and the bowel is drawn out to the left. The paired ceca are freed. Note the use of toothed forceps. These afford firm grip 
while damaging only a small amount of tissue. If such severely damaged tissue is encountered histologically, it is easily recognised. However, try to avoid sampling such damaged areas for histological examination. It is best not to separate the two arms of the U-shaped duodenum when this is reached, for the pancreas lies between and may be damaged. The origin of the duodenum is cut from the gizzard. The two arms of the duodenum can be opened and examined. If necessary, the opened duodenum and pancreas can then be fixed as a whole for histological examination. The remaining small intestine is opened, taking care not to damage the underlying mucosa by pushing the bottom blade of the scissors too deeply into the bowel lumen. Any part of the mucosa that shows abnormality can be examined microscopically by taking a scraping of the full thickness of the mucosa using a blade of the scissors or a scalpel blade. The mucosal sample is transferred to a microscope slide. A cover slip is applied and carefully pressed onto the sample using a pointed instrument, not your dirty glove. Microscopic examination of this wet preparation will reveal the presence of various stages of coccidiosis. The intestine is opened along its entire length. When the colon has been opened, examine the junction of the small intestine and colon at the base of the cecum. Note the small nodules of lymphoid tissue at this junction. These are known as the cecal tonsils and may bear small red spots which suggest local hemorrhage, but which are in fact normal. The paired cecum are opened. Scrapings of their mucosa may also be examined for cecal coccidiosis and always examine the very tips of the cecum where the small nematode Heterachus gallini may be found. Next, examine the gizzard, proventriculus and crop. The heavy muscular wall of the gizzard is cut with a knife. The incision is extended up through the proventriculus and lower esophagus to the crop. The 
the lining of the gizzard should be tough and tightly adherent to the mucosa, as in this bird. If it strips easily to reveal edema or underlying hemorrhage in a freshly dead bird, some form of toxic damage may be suspected. The crop is examined for type of feed and any degeneration of the mucosa. This bird has not eaten for 12 hours. The crop is empty and the mucosa is normal. The spleen is viewed by reflecting the gizzard to the left. This spleen is within the normal range of colour, size, shape and consistency. A sample for histological examination must be taken with minimal trauma to the tissue. Note the thickness of the slice that is taken. A thicker slice would not allow formalin to penetrate the tissue rapidly enough for good fixation. The spleen from this bird may be described as being enlarged and pale, but of normal texture and shape. For greater descriptive accuracy, measurement of dimensions and weight may be made. Note that the organ is handled as gently as possible while a sample is taken for histology. The cut surface may be described as pale, slightly mottled, but of normal consistency. This is an example of splenomegaly due to avian leukosis, a malignant neoplastic disease caused by a virus. The opened gizzard and proventriculus are reflected and laid out to the left. The sac is reflected. An increase in size of the heart in relation to the carcass gives the best indication of the presence of heart failure. This one is normal. The heart is removed by cutting through the vessels and atria at its base. The method of opening the heart in birds is simplified in this example. More detailed dissection will be demonstrated in the mammalian postmortem examinations. Here, the myocardium of right and left ventricles is simply divided from base to apex and the interior examined. Histological examination can be made after fixation of the whole opened heart in formalin. In cases of suspected septicemia, blood should be aseptically aspirated before removing the heart. The liver is inspected in situ at its size, colour and shape, noted relative to the carcass. Normal liver is very fragile and should be handled gently. The texture of the organ is noted during handling. The liver is carefully cut from its attachments. The surface may be cleaned by wiping with the knife blade. This is preferable to washing with water which causes osmotic damage to the superficial tissue. The size of the gallbladder is noted. 
Remember that in birds that have not been eating, the gallbladder has not been stimulated to empty and may appear over full. The colour and consistency of the bile in this bird is normal. The consistency of the liver is noted while cutting a block for histological examination. In this demonstration, the sample was taken after wiping the surface. Less histological artefact would be evident in the capsule if the sample had been taken before wiping. The attachments of the lung are freed and the lungs are carefully drawn away from their intimate association with the ribs and roof of the thorax. Normal aerated lung like this can be fixed by floating the organ unsliced in formalin as the fixative diffuses readily through this sort of tissue. The ovary in this bird is inactive. It is reflected to reveal the adrenal glands. The ovary and remains of the abdominal air sacs are removed to reveal the kidneys. Their size, shape and colour is noted. The ureters are checked for the presence of excessive amounts of white urates which may indicate nephrosis. The kidneys and ureters in this bird are grossly normal. The very friable consistency of normal kidney is evident on removing a sample for histology. This should be done before the kidneys are removed. The kidneys are now removed. After removal of the kidneys, the sciatic nerve plexus can now be observed on each side of the spinal column. The spinal column itself should be checked for deformity at this stage. The continuation of the sciatic nerve in each leg is displayed by reflecting the adductor muscle of the thigh. The normal unstretched nerve should be glistening white with fine cross striations. Now the fine intercostal nerves are examined. Particular attention to nerves is necessary in the diagnosis of Marek's disease a viral infection which causes enlargement and greyish discoloration of affected nerve. Here the brachial plexus is displayed on each side.
The spinal and vagus nerves in the neck can now be examined. While in this area, the thymus in young birds and the thyroid and parathyroid glands should be examined. The thyroids and parathyroids lie together on each side close to the origin of the common carotid arteries. Next, the leg joints may be examined. The tibiotarsal joint is opened by cutting the medial collateral and dorsal tibiotarsal ligaments and dislocating the joint. Pass the blade between the posterior end of the tibia and the sesamoid bone in the Achilles tendon. This will display the sheath of this tendon, which is continuous with the joint space. If swelling of any joint is apparent, it should be aspirated aseptically before opening the joint to provide a sample for microbiological examination. The stifle joint is opened in a similar manner. The growth plate of long limb bones should be examined. This is most important in young, lame meat birds that have grown rapidly. Here, part of the proximal end of the tibia is exposed and part of the bone is shaved off to reveal the growth plate area. It is normal in this adult layer type bird. The bone marrow should be examined by splitting the femur. The marrow in this bird is a normal red colour indicating normal erythropoiesis. A sample can be taken for histology after fixing the split bone in formalin. The brain can now be removed and examined. First, the head is removed by cutting through the atlanto-occipital joint. The atlantoaxial joint in this bird was dislocated when the neck was broken, hence the presence of the large hematoma. The cranium is skinned. Using pointed shears, the bone of the cranium is cut beginning just above the occipital condyles lateral to the foramen magnum. The incisions are extended on each side to meet above the eyes. Care must be taken to avoid damage to the underlying brain.
the cranial cap is carefully removed. The remnants of the dura mater are cut away, then the brain can be observed in situ. To remove the brain, cut the cranial nerves beneath it and gently displace the brain backward until it can be extracted and all surfaces examined. The brain should be fixed for histological examination by immersing it uncut in formalin. Finally, the spinal column should be split to enable detection of small spinal deformities. In this bird, the pelvic floor has already been cut away, during which dissection the bursa of Fabricius, not present in this mature bird, and the occasional persistent vestigial right overduct may be found. The spinal cord in this bird is quite straight. Sometimes posterior paralysis is caused in young meat birds by partial dislocation of the thoracolumbar spine. This concludes the program. While this dissection sequence is suitable for most routine examinations, experienced pathologists may change the sequence if the history or clinical signs suggest that a certain system is primarily affected. For example, if intestinal disease is suspected, the upper respiratory tract would not be examined until the gut had been inspected and samples taken, because in the gut, post-mortem degeneration due to the action of bacterial and mucosal enzymes is extremely rapid.